Hello and welcome to everyone. Yet another episode of AI in Food Safety Fireside Chats. And I am amazed and thrilled and uh, I was really expecting this, I have to tell you. Uh, welcoming Ashley, who is the founder and CEO of I Comply, to have a conversation about the amazing things that uh, she and her team are doing. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos, for the nice words and um, yeah, for the invitation to this uh, to this valuable chat, fireside chat. I really want to tell me what exactly is your team and your company doing? So uh, we are an um, early warning system for risks in the in the food supply chain. Basically, if you're a food manufacturer um, through our platform, you can see what kind of uh, uh, raw material risks your yeah um, your raw materials may have, and uh, take preventive actions accordingly. There is a bit of or a lot of intelligence there. Right? What kind of intelligence are you using? Uh, yes, yes, of course. I mean, meanwhile, there is no data without intelligence, right? So, I mean, the, also the uh, AI algorithms have developed so much that it is actually an integrated part of the normal coding, uh, let's say. And um, yes, uh, so the intelligence is, of course, uh, first of all, being able to associate the different risks with the substances and uh, the raw materials um, all together. And then the uh, second level of intelligence is uh, once all data is sorted out to be able to uh, predict uh, basically the future risks that are relevant for the users. That's very interesting. And, uh, you know, music in my ears, because I, I think I understand the two levels that you're describing. You're saying there is intelligence in the way that we collect and get the data together so that they make sense and then intelligence in how we can use it to see what is coming up uh, next. So let's start from uh, how it, these technologies are getting things together, are getting data together. What kind of data are you working with? Uh, well, it is different uh, types of data, basically a lot of uh, data from notifications, uh, authorities, um, but also different types of data is um, actually, um, yeah, integrated uh, into the platform. Any difficulties that you see, any challenges that are part of uh, your daily life at work? The data. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the more data you have, the more work you have. <laughs> So it looks like the data is good, but uh, yeah, um, every new um, data source you connect, basically, uh, you need to manage it, maintain it, uh, etc. Um, and then also very, I think, very important. Uh, this is a challenge and also opportunities uh, to make sense of the data that you have for your users. You no, know? how can they do with it? What, how can they use it? So otherwise, uh, if they cannot tell a story out of it, data itself is useless. If they cannot tell a story out of data, it's useless. How do you do this? Do you have a secret in having the data telling stories? Uh, we don't really have a secret. I think our our uh, approach is very straightforward. We try to understand the customer. We try to uh, put ourselves in their situation and um, and um, and go from there. And of course, we are very much um, uh, have a good network to understand that. And in addition to that, I come from a uh, product safety side. I have worked there for 14 years before I started iComply. I um, uh, yeah, in my last role, I was managing the product development and innovation of uh, one of the largest testing inspection and certification companies uh, globally with, 40 with a team of 40 people. And uh, so that's where I start to saw the opportunity basically of uh, um, uh, data driven risk management in the food on the food sector. Uh, but yes, uh, coming back to uh, to your question, how we make sense out of it is uh, over or throughout these years, um, I have done business development. That was my focus. And that's what helped me actually a lot to understand um, the um, quality assurance uh, person perspective, you know, and uh, what they are looking for, what they're concerned about, uh, what they want to do, what they don't want to do, even the character type to some extent, I can say. You know, it's, uh, yeah. 
the perspective of the person that is actually taking the decision. And I hear you say that your experience being in their shoes and being in the market in the product safety side has been of value now that you are in a different role, designing and thinking and offering solutions. There. That's very interesting. I really like this approach. And then you also said intelligence and these technologies like AI to see what is coming up. I want to hear more about this. It's about how the people are using the systems and that's what we look at. What do people want to predict? Um, and uh, so one of the things, uh, for instance, at the uh, that uh, we'll be uh, presenting in two weeks' time is that uh, the case of ethylene oxide. So most of the time, actually, the prediction is more requested uh, when people meet a situation that they did not expect. And then they start thinking, what could I have done? Why did I miss this? What could I have done? to be able to expect this, uh, this, this risk? Or what can I do now so that next time I'm not caught unattended? And what can I have done so that I was not caught uh, uh, unexpecting it? And what can I do now so that next time it doesn't happen again? Eh? Exactly, exactly. So, so, uh, so one thing, for instance, uh, we saw that in the case of ethylene oxide, I think um, the whole uh, food industry is a common point. You know, anytime you meet somebody anywhere, you can start talking about ethylene oxide and the conversation uh, flies. So after this uh, ethylene oxide uh, situation, we did, uh, um, there was a request from the market, really, what could I have done to um to expect uh the what could why did i miss it what could i have done to um to avoid it and uh, and that is why actually uh, taken with this uh, question and also pesticide is a risk that you don't know it if you don't test it you know it's um, yeah it's just uh, pretty difficult to uh, to to predict if you are not aware of the market practices and um, yes, yeah, so so that's why we developed Pace to Predict, in which uh, we actually uh, um, are able to predict the um, the pesticides uh, that are likely to um, to come on a certain um, on a certain raw material, and uh, this helps uh, basically manufacturers uh, to be better prepared for uh, for what may come. So I will ask you more about this because I'm really interested. You know this. But uh, I want to come back to the two scenarios, crisis or risks that you described. Um, the ethylene oxide crisis and the case of uh, residues, pesticide residues in, in raw materials. In my eyes and understanding, they have also some differences in the sense that I remember when the ETO crisis hit the market, it was something unexpected and new. So mm. we couldn't expect this historically. It's not that we had past history. So it started happening week after week, a recall here, a recall there. And what we, we are saying, what I, I was thinking when we were looking at the data was that the best that we can do is to very quickly identify these early signals and understand that something is going wrong. I want to hear your thoughts about the way that I'm thinking about this. What do you think? Maybe there is something more that you know, that you have. I thought. mean, definitely, this is extremely important to uh, to be able to see the early signals. What is really emerging um, in the market? What's coming up new that is currently uh, that we are not uh, currently aware of? So this is uh, this is extremely important, and you may. Um, even sometimes, I don't know, see uh, um, what is actually uh, something that's coming up for a certain substance, for instance, even if it's not necessarily for the raw material that you are looking for, um, to understand, um, is this something that I may expect uh, for my own raw materials as well? You're saying that this, this is the kind of early warning that uh, you're also talking about, that something is happening Maybe I'm looking for it, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. And I pick up very quickly the signals. And then you mentioned the second scenario. I, in the way that I think about this, maybe I'm wrong, just uh, thinking out loud now. Eh? 
the residue case, this is where we have more data of something that we have been testing for many, many years, and the trends are a little bit more long-term. What do you see uh, in the data that you look at? How, how do you see these kind of problems? I was thinking that in the case of uh, pesticide residues, uh, this is uh, a signal that is not something unexpected, but it's something that we constantly look for. So maybe we look for something that we do expect, but we want to catch it before it goes uh, above limit. But maybe the way that I think about this is uh, oversimplifying things. So I want to hear your opinion about this. Okay, so I think uh, it's, uh, you're right, pesticide residues is not a new, is not a new risk definitely, but I think the question is which pesticide residues, you know? And uh, so in the case of ethylene oxide, of course, everybody knew that there could be pesticides, but uh, but nobody thought that ethylene oxide could be in there. And there are thousands of pesticides out there. It is also practically impossible for a, uh, for a purchaser to test for all possible pesticides uh, that may or may not be used on this product. It's just economically, it's simply not feasible. It's also not, not necessary. So, um, so I think it's important that um, uh, that you know what you are going to look for. So what I hear you say is that the range of products, uh, agrochem products that are being used have so many potential contamination residues, chemical contamination residues, that understanding and looking at the data about what kind of chemical contaminants we see on the rise is essential to decide then what should we be focusing on. This makes perfect sense. So now tell me, Ashley, what is this new uh, offering that you will be talking about going to, to do? Oh yeah, so it's about pesticide risk prediction. So basically for any given raw material, uh, we can tell the users what kind of uh, uh, what kind of pesticides uh, are likely to come in their um, in their raw materials and this is a prediction model that you fit with data what kind of data do you use in such uh, prediction model well it's uh, actually um, just uh, publicly available data that we are using and depending on uh, on the customer if they would like to add data of course we are also adding their own data okay. um, uh, but it's uh, basically publicly available data which from which there is uh, quite a lot like the recalls and why something was recalled because it was chemical contamination uh, what are the yes, types of exactly, exactly. So it's a uh, difference. Of course, also you cannot put all chemical contamination into a single uh, bucket because uh, the reasons why a pesticide is there may be completely different, why mycotoxins are there or lead is there, etc. So in order to be able to uh, make a proper um, um, prediction, it's important to understand the underlying reasons for the different risks, for the different hazards uh in the different regions for the different raw materials uh so that you can make actually uh um an accurate to the extent possible i should say prediction it's interesting because i had this uh, exact conversation with uh, some uh, data scientist in our team and he was telling me we have hundreds of possible candidate models depending on what you want to choose as a combination uh, how can we choose the right one for this particular problem from all these uh, hundreds? Yes. Do you have a solution for that? Do you have an advice? <laughs> that I have to ask the data scientist. I'm not a data scientist. I don't know. <laughs> but you have the market knowledge. Eh? How, what would be your advice to, to people that can work with the data, can work with the models, but they miss this priority view, this, this priority filter from the market? I think they need to understand the customer. They need to understand the customer. I think they That's need to understand, important. they need to have a certain domain knowledge, which I understand is difficult for a data scientist. Mm -hmm. But then you need to have teams of people, business side, domain experts, data scientists who come together and discuss really, first of all, the challenge. So the problem with the data scientist is not, not blaming anybody, yeah? But is that he will make a lot of predictions here, prediction there, prediction. Yeah. The question is, so what? You know, 
and and it is very important to do the right prediction and it may be also very simple it can be also very complicated but it's important to do the right thing and then also i think in a feasible time frame to get a feeling of will i get somewhere i, I also find this is a challenge with data science like you can throw in money and more and more money and more money and data scientists will always say, I need more data. And then you buy more data, you search for more data, you have people searching for data, you clean the data, three months are gone, you know, and the data scientist said, didn't work. So you're saying <laughs> we have an accuracy of 30%, okay, it's like disappear. Okay, so you go to the whole thing again, you know, <clears throat> and I think, uh, um, I think that by having discussions within teams with different, um, coming from different backgrounds, uh, it's uh, very important to understand really um, what is the challenge I'm trying to resolve and what is the simplest way to get there? What is the most straightforward way to get there? And yeah. The most straightforward and simple way to get to the solution. It doesn't have to be, I mean, from my perspective, it doesn't have to be the most sophisticated technology. It has to work, you know? And if the easier one is working, then use the easier one. If the easier one is not working, increase your your level of complexity. Uh, but also always keeping into account is this level of complexity that I'm building in going parallel to my business expectations, no? You can make a completely high, uh, I don't know, very good neural networks uh, model that I don't know, uses, I don't know how many uh, uh, hours to calculate and costs a lot of money, but the problem is actually not that big. So, so then you can save, the, you can look for another problem, I think, um, or another solution. So it's always important to understand, yeah, if what you're, um trying to do is uh, is the right thing and you're you having the right methodology so understanding the challenge very well keeping an eye on the simplest straightforward path to the solution making sure that you have time frames in mind you can also work on that project and consume data and money forever but i think what i really liked about uh, what i hear you describing is that it's a dialogue between people with different backgrounds and from different disciplines. Huh? I, I was listening to stories uh, from clients that were saying there was an amazing data science team that came, took our data and left to solve the problem. And then they came six months afterwards and they said, ah, we cannot solve it. Not surprising, not, su not and surprising. I, I can also understand maybe the problem is also not solvable, you know, uh, okay. for whatever reason, it's possible. But yeah, that's the challenge with data science. I think that you don't know if the problem is going to be solved. But the question is, did it take them really six months? Or why did it take them six months to figure it out? You know, did you was the problem so important that? Yeah, I don't know. But um, yeah, it can always happen. I think this is the this is the risk. It can happen that you spend a lot of money and you have nothing. <laughs> so in many cases, we cannot solve the problems. But I think that that's why you're saying the dialogue, the conversation is important. It's yep. important to touch point, discuss this, so that you can get the early feedback and not after several months. What do you think, Ashley, about the AI trends and all the buzzwords and all the conversations. What's what's your view on what is happening right now uh, in the market? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm actually with like I think like similar to the rest of the world, extremely fascinated by ChatGPT. It's incredible how simple it is. It's incredible how clever it is. It's incredible how diverse it is in terms of questions i think it's going to change the world uh, it has started but there will be so many more impacts that we are seeing in positive and in negative um it's i think an incredible uh yeah incredible development and i'm 
very curious uh, to see what it's going to bring and how it's going to be used. I read, I read recently, yeah, I read recently that actually some people were stuck in an elevator. Uh, a group of uh, a group of uh, entrepreneurs, startups, and uh, so using ChatGPT, they were able to get out of the elevator before the rescue team came. So I mean, it's incredible how like how different ways there are that you can actually use this uh, use this tool. It's uh, it's mind blowing, from child's tutor. To I don't know what you know. It's uh, yeah. I think this. And is what about maybe... food safety? What do you think? Sorry. What about food safety? Applications in food safety? Yeah, I mean, I think in food safety. Uh, I mean, what I have seen in also in my uh, previous life with the corporates is that quality managers are not are normally very experienced and. Um, and they're um, uh, maybe, let me say, for a youngster, quality management is not the first thing they want to jump into, you know. And that is why the people you meet in the industry, like me, are not the youngest people, you know. And uh, and also, they are very experienced. But the, so the, it is very difficult for younger people to get in because without experience, there is really not so much you can do. You have to constantly ask people. But uh, actually, systems like ours, but at the same time, ChatGPT is uh, giving so much domain expert that, of course, you have to check it. But to proceed, it's, I think, uh, um, or come to the next level. I think it's very important to uh, that or even the younger people, the younger generations are motivated or fed with this type of uh, information. I think it can bring down the average age of the quality management. <laughs> uh, that's very teams. that's very interesting what you're saying. I, I have never thought about it that these tools, because they can help in getting the knowledge uh, in front of people that don't have the experience yet, they can ease the transition and they can get more people into these professions. And you are right. I agree with what you are saying, but not about the the age, but about the special mentality, systematic and uh, scientific mentality that people need to have in food safety and uh, quality management. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's. I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's an incredible tool and uh, very exciting to see what's going to happen there. Yeah. What is your big dream? about uh, the company, about the things that you're doing, where, where would you like to take it uh, next? Uh, I mean, in terms of, uh, of course, uh, more, um, a bigger uh, mission is um, have the, um, be able to contribute and be able to avoid risks that could, uh, um, that could pose a risk for all living beings, uh, let me say, um, also keeping the, uh, bio biodiversity so that is a very high level mission i can say but i think that the more people uh, use our system um the uh, the safer the world will become or systems like ours i have to say you have also a very similar system so i think that's how the safe the uh, uh, system is going to become i'm actually i was uh, talking to a colleague about a company um who has a very, very uh, serious quality problems. And um, and uh, my friend said, oh, you don't want your, your platform to be mentioned together with them because uh, they really have a very bad quality reputation. I said, how will they get better if they don't use our system? You know, right. we have to help them. We have to help them. Now you cannot say I'm not selling you. You are bad in quality. I'm selling you because you are bad in quality and you have to get better because tomorrow I'm going to be eating the food you manufacture or my child or my neighbor or somebody else in the world. And uh, I think the more people use our systems and work on the quality side, um, yeah, the safer the world will become. All right. At the end of the day, we are consuming, all of us are consuming uh, the food 
that is being produced and your team, our team, and many, many others that are developing digital technologies in the space, we are contributing to this uh, big goal uh, that you're describing. So I really agree with what you're saying. So wrapping it up, if the, there is one thing that you would like the audience to keep from our conversation, what would that be? Be open to new technologies. Yeah, actually, I need to tell you some, a story again because this is very I interesting. Love stories. Tell me a story. So I was uh, asking ChatGPT uh, to write a story about iComply. So a Disney story about iComply. So I was saying we are doing this and this. And, you know, it generated this. Um, and I only asked it to make a story and what the business we are doing. It generated this story in which there is a robot which predicts the results in which there is a normal person and in which there is a quality manager. And the quality manager did not like the robot because it said, this is completely new, I'm going to reject it. So this was, I did not ask it to do that, but uh, this was the story that ChatGPT created. And then after, at the end of the story, everybody was very happy and the world was saved, you know, as in the Disney stories. And uh, so, so my message is, Let's not be this uh, bad guy uh, in the Disney story. Let's be open. Let's uh, open up. Uh, let's be friends uh, with technology, with each other, with the networks, and make work together to make it safer. You know, technology is not, I mean, our technology is not going to replace people. ChatGPT may, I don't know, it may replace all of us, but uh, our intention is not, um, it will replace, it will replace, but especially if you don't use it, then it may replace you even more probably. But in any case, I think we have to embrace the technology that is there and always work. What, well, how can I improve the work we are, I'm doing today through technology? I think this is, this is our responsibility and I invite everybody to do this. You invite everyone to be more open and to embrace technology even if we are a little bit afraid of it sometimes. Eh? Exactly. Very well formulated. That's a, an excellent message. Ashley, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you today with me. Thank you. Thank you for the nice questions, Nikos, and for the invitation again. It was a pleasure.